Amen. Amen. And thanks be to God for this holy season. I want to welcome you again to the first Sunday of this season that we call Advent. Such a strange time of sacred and secular preparation that gives a whole new meaning to the term hurry up and wait. The culture pushes us to hurry up. Get your shopping done, get your house decorated, be the first in line for the best deals. And meanwhile, the church, it seems, is always trying to put on the brakes. Slow down, not so fast. We've got four weeks to go. Let's just light one candle every week. Let's just open one window every day. Wait for the Lord's coming with patience and peace. Add to that the strange dynamic of waiting, patiently or impatiently, for a baby who was already born 2,000 years ago. A prophecy long ago fulfilled and yet still waiting for completion. An Advent feels kind of like, if I can borrow a phrase, a wrinkle in time. Listen to this morning's scripture reading, for example. You'll recognize the words, especially if you are a fan of Handel's Messiah. But even if you don't recognize the words, you'll recognize the universal human longing for light, for hope, for comfort, for peace, for justice. The prophecy is a promise. It's an answer to prayer. But as you hear it read this morning, I invite you to reflect with me in what ways do you find this promise has been fulfilled? And in what ways are we still waiting? Hear the words from the prophet Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Words of hope for a hopeful people. Thanks be to God. So maybe it's just the English major in me, but this passage has always seemed like a kind of odd blend of past tense and future promise. The people have seen a great light. The light has shined. The child has been born, like it's already happened even though Isaiah is writing 700 years before the birth of Christ. And meanwhile, the second half of the passage is future tense. His authority shall grow. There shall be endless peace and justice. From this time forward, the Lord of hosts will do this. But I'm not sure that we've seen these things all come to pass, even with the coming of Christ. Prophecy, you know, is often kind of a mix of the already and the not yet. The prophet speaks a word of comfort or dread. Hear, O oh people, what God has planned for you. The vision is clear, the path is decided, but it has not yet come to pass. And in fact, your response to the prophecy still matters. You can accept this prophecy or act now to avert it. And your actions may hasten or delay the fulfillment of the vision. But ultimately, God holds your future. The history is always moving toward a fulfillment of God's plan. And each new generation chooses whether to live into that plan with hope or to fight it off with fear. The first people ever to hear this prophecy from Isaiah were the people of Judah, 700 and something years before the coming of Christ. That's where act one of this story takes place. The royal palace, the city of Jerusalem, the year 734 or so BCE. Judah's king was a man named Ahaz. 
who was trying to keep his kingdom safe from invaders like Syria and Egypt. While God's word was reassuring, hang in there, trust me, live by my laws, lean into my covenant, we'll get through this thing together. Still, Ahaz doubted. Trusting God sounded great on a theological level, but practically speaking, there were enemies already on the horizon headed his way. You can see where he's coming from. It's not that Ahaz wasn't inspired by the hosts of heaven, it's just that he was looking for a little help on the ground. King Ahaz decided to enter into a political alliance with the king of Assyria, a powerful monarch named Tiglath-Pileser, to protect him. So the prophet, Isaiah, came to King Ahaz and said, don't ally with Assyria. Tiglath-Pileser may be strong, but he doesn't care about you. The protection he offers comes at great price, and it won't last. Trust instead in God, who has always been there for you, who is even now making a way for your deliverance. Maybe you remember these words from the same prophecy from Isaiah chapter 7. Look, the young woman, and some translations say the virgin, is with child and she'll bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. God not only has plans for you, Isaiah tells Ahaz, God has plans for your enemies too. They're on the future foreclosure list. Soon their lands will be deserted and Assyria too will be conquered. But God, who reigns forever, has put you on the long-term love list. Already a child is born for you who will grow up to be a king, a wonderful counselor, a prince of peace. He will lead Judah to safety and security and justice from this time onward and forevermore. Don't trade in God's long-term peace for Pileser's short-term protection. Wait for the Lord. Unfortunately, Ahaz couldn't wait. He chose Assyria's defense over God's, making Judah a dependent vassal of the 8th century superpower. The cost of protection was high. Financially and spiritually, a lot of Judah's money went into Assyria's bank account. And a lot of Tiglath-Pileser's gods and idols found their way into the Jerusalem temple. But despite all Ahaz's financial and and moral sacrifices, the truth was that Assyria cared nothing for Judah. The moment they resisted even a little bit, the powerful ally became a powerful enemy. God's people were conquered by a foreign nation, but even more so conquered by their own fears. God provided a plan, but God's people couldn't wait to see it come to pass. Act two, Nazareth, first century AD. 700 something years later, Israel and Judah are still under oppression from foreign powers. In act two, It's Rome who's in charge, still exacting taxes from the Jews, still disrespecting their religious identity, still making their lives hard. The people are still walking in darkness. And yet, in the midst of that darkness, whispers of a kind of holy resistance are circulating from this little town in Galilee called Nazareth, a nowhereville, an unremarkable little village in the great Roman Empire, that a virgin has conceived a child by the Holy Spirit, and he just may be God's Messiah. It seems unlikely, even fantastic, that this crazy rumor out of Nazareth could have anything to do with a 700-year-old promise that God has already tried to fulfill once. But... There have been reports of angel visitations, 
and a star in the sky. And even some visiting scholars from Persia stopped by the library in Jerusalem to check out the ancient prophecies. Isaiah, yes, but also Micah, who foretold that the king whom God would raise up to save God's people would be born in Bethlehem. Remember these words? But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient days. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. So this sounds like the same prophet promise that God gave to Isaiah. Could it be the promise is finally coming to pass? How long will it take for this baby to grow up and receive his authority? How long? And will the people listen to him any better than they listen to the prophets? Will they be willing to let him be king of their hearts and lives? Or is it just earthly protection they desire? Well, if you've read the Gospels, you know how that turned out. The child to be born was Jesus, and he did, in fact, save the people from their sins. He was, in fact, the light of the world for those walking in darkness. He did, in fact, show them the way to the Father. He was the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And some received him, and some did not. The sacrifice changed the world, and yet, and yet we are still very much the same. Which brings us to Act 3, the Church of Jesus Christ in the year 2019. The people are still walking in darkness. We face the same human condition. We function out of fear. We make the wrong alliances. We don't trust our leaders. We don't really trust God either. And into that darkness, into this current reality, we hear the prophets still calling to us over 2,700 years. I'm going to invite you to read the prophecy aloud and to reflect on those words for us. Please. The people who walked in darkness... Amen. Thank you for participating with me. It turns out I left the last page of my sermon on the copy machine, so thank goodness for Andrew who had another copy. <laughs> Friends, is this prophecy what, not what we long for? Is this not what we have waited for, not just in our lifetime, but for thousands of years? Peace, justice, righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. That song? A little town of Bethlehem, turns out it was right. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in this one little child, in this one king. The longing is universal and it lives in every land. Even people who never watch the news yearn for peace, for a sense of rightness and balance and strength to face the challenges of each day. Think about it. Where are the places in our own lives where we are yet walking in darkness? Where it feels like we pay heavy tribute to mortal powers that do not care for us? What are the gods and idols that we have allowed to occupy our hearts and minds? What are the fears that keep us from living in freedom and joy? What are the hopes that we carry silently into the coming year? Perhaps those hopes and fears could be the substance of our prayer in the coming week. 
as together we offer them up to the God who really can change our world and our lives if, if we are willing to be changed. For it seems to me that the question isn't so much whether God wants to save us, but whether we want to be saved. A child, after all, has been born for us. He has come and walked among us, and yet each and every day we choose whether to acknowledge him. His birth only really matters to us if it really matters to us. Our generation, like everyone before it, has a choice to make. Will we receive him? Will we accept him? Will we wait for him? Because his peace takes time. It takes patience. It takes a willingness to be transformed from the inside out. Maybe that's why we have such a hard time seeing the fulfillment of the prophet's words in our world, because they've not yet been completely fulfilled in our own hearts. God offers a different kind of saving than the captive world knows to ask for. And I don't just mean saving like, can you say that you've been saved? I mean, have you made room for him in your heart this season? Have you invited him in there right now? Are you allowing him to dig down into your fears and replace them with hope? Hope for a better world, hope for a peaceful future, hope for justice and righteousness and what the prophets call shalom. It takes time. We don't transform quickly, but one day at a time, one person at a time, God is shining a light into our darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. I invite you to pray with me, silently or aloud. Holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, O Lord Emmanuel. Amen.